It's Comp 3025, and it's uh, officially week two. Um, and it's lesson two, officially, part one, right? And we're talking about the kind of books and resources we need. And like I said, I highly recommend this book here, iOS 8, uh, Programming iOS 8 from Deedle and Deedle. This is the one we're going to be using uh, for this class. There's also uh, the Swift Programming Language, which is free. I think it's a good resource to kind of take a look at. It comes right from Apple, and it kind of uh, details the Swift language um, as much as we're going to want it uh, for over the next 14 weeks or 13 weeks. The good thing about uh, uh, the book is it kind of goes through, um, I'm just going to go to the book for a second. It kind of goes through all the essentials. So today we're going to be kind of looking at week one and week two. We're going to do a little bit of Swift essentials. The challenge is that the computer in front of you doesn't have Swift ready yet, right? Which is a problem. But there are some free online resources, almost like playgrounds, that we can go to right now and check out Swift and try it out. So that's what we're going to do tonight, right? Um, so again, uh, Xcode basics, we'll talk about that uh, next week, and we'll go into assignment one, right? Which will be pretty much some kind of simple app that you're going to have to put together for uh, uh, with Xcode and, um, and Swift. A very simple app. Like something that's going to be like ridiculous, right? Well, we have to do something like that because for your first assignment, you have to get into how do you use Swift. There must be some kind of controls. How do you link the controls? All these kind of things that we have to talk about that we're going to be doing, right? So that's assignment number one. It'll be due a couple weeks uh, from next week. Uh, we'll keep going with Swift syntax and Swift collections. And each week, we're going to be trying to uh, we're going to follow the book and kind of work with different apps: the Welcome app, the Tip Calculator app, the Twitter searches app, and so on. Uh, following the book uh, week by week. Next, the next half of the semester after the break, we're going to hit Sprite Kit, and this is where some of the um, some of the flexibility that I have comes into play, right? Because I've covered all the basics, and when we hit Sprite Kit, now we're doing game again. Hello, right? And then I get into the stuff that I like to do, which means we get back into that old hat of, hey, make a game maybe for your uh, final project, or make uh, you know an app for your final project. I'll give you both options, right? In your final project, you're going to be able to work with somebody else, like before, or you're on your own. And I'm sure there's going to be people who say, well, I want to work with three people or two people. You're making an app, right? I'm going to let you make an app for iPad as well as your iPhone, depending on what you want. And it's going to be one app that you're going to do on your own, right? There's also going to be an app. Uh, so there's two projects. There's the project of your own that you're going, to, you're going to kind of put together or package on your own. And there's going to be a project that you're going to do with somebody else or on your own, right? So kind of a bigger project by the end. A very similar structure to what we've seen before. What I want to do is each assignment is going to build to give you enough skills so to kind of add to your final project. I don't want to give you uh, kind of assignments that are unrelated. And then at the end of the day, you're like, well, OK, I learned how to do this and learned how to do this, but how do I do this? So each one will build up on the other one. So you'll, uh, you'll take those skills and move forward with them. And the great thing is, it's an app-driven approach. We're going to see lots of apps. Like, for example, by week nine, we'll have seen at least the Canon game app with Sprite Kit. But again, once we get into Sprite Kit, Sprite Kit's very powerful. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. Um, but we can also th use things like Sparrow, which is, um, I, I talked about Starling last semester when I was with you guys uh, on the ActionScript side. They've also come up with something like called Sparrow, which is a game framework. And there's many other game frameworks like Cocos 2D and everything else that'll work nicely with iOS, um, iPhone, and iPad. So that's really it in a nutshell. Uh, we're going to talk about multi-touch event handling by week 10 and uh, a little bit of core data by week 11. Core data is a much more complex subject. That could take two weeks, in my opinion. Right? When I looked at core data, when I first started looking at iPhone development, it was like I was busting my head against the wall. Right? It was quite complex. And sometimes it can be um, confusing. Right? You need to know, in order for you to be successful in this class, which I know all of you will be, you need to understand MVC frameworks. So if you've never used an MVC framework before, um, it's something that you need to kind of think about. Am I going to be good? If I, do I understand what MVC frameworks are? And I'm going to talk about MVC frameworks almost as an aside as we start off maybe next week or the week after. Because I think we touched them, but we never actually did them, right? Understanding what a model view controller uh, pattern is, right? The other thing that we want to kind of look at is um, we want to look at the storyboard idea. Because the storyboard is something that Apple uses um, almost like to understand how it has its, its scenes. 
So you start off with almost like one screen, then you go to the second screen, the third screen, and it uses the storyboard as a vehicle for us to move from screen to screen. How you doing? Hey. <laughs> All right, so that's something that we have to learn how to do as well. So there's a bunch of stuff we have to go through, and I know some of you don't like Macs and don't like uh, iOS and all that kind of stuff, but it's going to be an opportunity for us to uh, to kind of get break into a, a very lucrative market. There are a lot of opportunities building iOS uh, applications, maybe more so than Android, maybe. Um, but we're going to be talking about them as we go. Any questions around the syllabus? If you notice, I've given you a couple weeks at the end, 12 and 13, uh, to work on your stuff here physically. If you want to, I know some of you may decide not to, because that's what happens, right? Uh, and by week 14, I'm hoping to come up with a few presentations, and some, some of you are going to screencast, as I know you will. This is a pretty tight class, um, which is okay, but I'm going to be continuing to uh, produce the videos week after week, so that if you miss something, worst case scenario, you can look at the video and catch up. Questions around this? We have a lot of work to do. Um, and again, we only have 13 weeks instead of 14 weeks. Um, I would have started last week if I had known, but I just kind of, they kind of slipped me in uh, this week. Okay. So that's that in a nutshell. Let's start off with uh, the first piece. And let's talk about playgrounds a little bit before we get into the PowerPoint presentation. I like the PowerPoints, but I like to use them as a backdrop. I don't like to th uh, think about them so much as um, something I want to follow uh, slide to slide, although I will cover the most of them today. So I'm going to go into my, I've set up my Mac, um, so I have kind of a few tabs here. One of them is um, almost like my design um, folder, and there's another one that's kind of my developer folder. It just keeps them separate for me. I don't have to set it up this way, but I kind of like the way it works for me, right? In there, I can go into Xcode. And Xcode is going to be our main IDE. We're going to focus more upon, upon that next week. But if you notice, there's a couple of options here when I go into Xcode for the first time. And this is Xcode 6. So if you look at Xcode in front of you, it may not be the Xcode that I have. I'm pretty sure it's not. So take a look at, log into your, your machine in front of you. If you haven't had a chance, if, you, if it's 5 on 1, if you don't have Xcode 6, there's a good chance, a highly good chance, that you won't have access to this thing that's called a playground. Um, so I'll show you what it looks like, uh, although we won't be able to do it. I can choose uh, iOS or OS X which means Coco, right? Let's stick with iOS, and we'll call this, um, you know, uh, Playground 1. doesn't matter what we call it. Just follow along for now. You just have to watch, and that's all. Okay, so it tells me where I want to create it. Let's put it on our, I'm going to put it on my uh, desktop for now, and I'll erase it later. Okay, so this is great. So what happens is with Playground, we want to start learning the language, Swift. But we don't want to open up a project. We don't want to have multiple parts. So what Apple figured out is, look, if normally when I'm learning a, a, a programming language like Java or C Sharp or JavaScript, name it, whatever, X programming language, I have to open up a project. I have to have multiple files. I have to look at different folders. What if we had a way of playing around with language right, without having to do that? And so they've taken on this idea of playgrounds, where you have one single file where you can test out some, some ideas and see how things work with Swift. Um, and yet, that open up uh, a whole pile of other, other, of other uh, related files or unrelated files. So that's what playgrounds really are. And you can make as many playgrounds as you want, uh, almost like little places where you can try stuff out, experiments. Let's try it out, see if it works in Swift. If it doesn't give you an error, then you can incorporate it into your own code. So a total different way of thinking then uh, we're opening up a project, we're following this project-based approach. So how, do we go, how are we going to learn Swift tonight when we don't have access to the um, uh, Xcode 6 in front of you? So the way to do that is there's a couple of online uh, free playgrounds, so to speak, that you can go to. One of them is, well, first of all, this the Swift overview is where we have to, I would, I think this is a good resource for you. If you're learning Swift for the first time, to understand what Swift is, Apple, uh, developer apple.com, gives you an idea of um, what Swift is at a very, very high level, right? So if you want to read that on your own, that's fine. There's a really a lot of good developer resources from Apple, by the way. Here's one, SwiftStub, SwiftStub.com. If you want to go there, 
Um, you can we can talk about our first Swift program whether you have uh, access to Xcode six or not, right? And if you don't like this one, this is Swift stub, and this does exactly what pretty much what a what a playground does, where I can kind of I can I can define a variable, my variable if I can type, and I can say hello world, right? And um, once I do that. The idea behind the playground is um, it gives us a, a, the, the ability for us to see what the value of my variable is, right? Now, if you notice, it's not as instant as I'd like it to be, but it also gives you the idea of, uh, you know, that there's, there's an error because the expression resolves an unused value, my variable. I'm not doing anything with my variable, but it allows you to kind of compile on the fly, if you will. So this is one of them. The other one is try Swift in the browser. Right, so runswiftlang.com, right? Another one, and if you notice, it gives you a resolution uh, with a print line statement. Okay, so there's a couple of resources we can use tonight, even though we don't have access to Swift um, and the playgrounds that are available to us in, 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 on the machine in front of you. So it's not like we can't do anything tonight. That would be wrong to say that, and I didn't want to leave you like that. You know, if next week, Ross assures me, and it's recorded now on, on uh, YouTube. Ross assures me everything's going to be okay, and we're going to have access to the full suite of resources, including Xcode. Let's move on. So again, 3025. So let's talk about this Swift stuff anyway, and do a little bit of a history, because some of you know it, but some of you don't care about iOS stuff so much. I don't want to make this a total sleeper, so we'll take a break uh, partway through. But I want you guys to be able to read it. I, the um, PowerPoint is up online already. It's on Blackboard. So if you don't like looking up there because it's not your style of doing stuff, you can certainly look in, at the computer in front of you. Okay, okay so let's take a look. Um, so we want to talk about things like the iPhone and iPad gestures. A little bit of a history. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to like speed through this like a speed demon, right? We're going to talk the uh, iPhone 6, the 6 Plus, and the Apple Watch. Who, by, by chance, who has the iPhone 6? Anyone buy it in the room? Like me? Am I the only one? I got the, oh yeah, there we go. there's two of us, right? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, and I, I, the reason why I bought it, actually, I had the, I had the this is the story that I want to tell you. I had an opportunity to, to upgrade, right? My iPhone 4 was dying. I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. It, was, it kept on resetting. And every time I uploaded, and this is the bad thing, when you up, upgrade to iOS 8 on your iPhone 4S, as an example, it's pretty slow. The iPhone 4 won't take iOS 8. It'll only go to 7.12, I believe, or something like that. Anyways, it was so slow, I couldn't use it. It would reset, right? And I was like, man, you know, I'm a computer teacher. I want to be able to get a new phone. And I, I whined to my wife, short story, you know, and she said, okay, right? And that's how I got it. Now, it's an expensive one because I wanted to get 128 gigs space on this thing because I know that I take a lot of pictures and videos and all that kind of stuff and that's where I fill up the most. That and audiobooks. I probably do more of that than anything else. And that's my usage. I don't do a lot of games, right? Because games aren't the thing that I do on this. If I'm going to play games, I'm going to play it on this or on my iPad. Oh yeah, Jean-Luc, that uh, virtual box. It's, good, it's, it's good. running, it's running. It's crazy. Right? Um, so, that's, so that's the reason why I got it. Um, and I didn't want to get the, i6, the iPhone 6 Plus because I'm not sure if you guys have seen it, but it's massive. Like it's like, reason I'll buy one now. it's like literally I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't put my thumb across the phone, right? And it was hard to put in my pocket. Like it was, it was bulky, right? So I wanted to have a phone in my pocket. That's the kind of, that's how I use my phone. So it was a little bit too big for me to do that comfortably. And that's why I didn't get it. Not because I didn't want it. That was the first thing I thought about, just like you. But as soon as I handled it, I realized, no, right? Yeah, it's big, but it was just like, it's just too bulky for me, right? Um, but I am planning on getting the Apple Watch because it's supposed to make you lose weight. And you know all the holidays over the last little while. It's crazy, right? You just put it on. So that that taptic interface and this whole thing with, I've always wanted a, a, a watch that keeps track of your heart rate and connects to your phone. And it's probably one of the only ones out there so far that do both. Let's see. It hasn't been released yet. And who knows, it's going to be probably a thousand bucks, right? We'll see how it comes out, huh? I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised either. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about Xcode 6 a little bit, the IDE, and what uh, kind of features it gives us, the iOS simulator. We'll kind of, we're going to preview an app called the Welcome app, 
up on Xcode. Now you can't use the welcome app, but I can. I'm going to pull it up. And if you have access to other resources like Jean-Luc, right? Or if you're an Aaron and you've got your own little life, uh, little Mac or a follower. <laughs> He followed you? He followed you? Sorry. Yes, all together, right? Sorry, what did I say? Right. She's never, she's never right. She's never right. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So, Talk to me when you're going to Yosemite. But <laughs> once, you, once you have that kind of stuff, if you can follow along with me today, then you can pull up the welcome app, um, which I will share. I'll, I'll throw it up. During the break, I'll throw it up on, on Blackboard, and you can download it and, and check it out. Okay? Um, We'll talk about object-oriented programming concepts because they're going to apply to the stuff we do. I'm not going to cover it slide by slide. Uh, I refuse to do that because it takes too long. But I want to talk about that and then maybe talk about some things that are good for iOS apps, a little bit of iOS security, and maybe if we have a chance to do that, what do you do with um, you know, for the really cool stuff that exists there for iOS developers? And I kind of came up with a couple of them already. I think two really cool publications, that stuff that came out from Apple, um, I'm surprised and happy that they've come up with a book from Apple to tell you how to do stuff, because they never did that with Objective-C, right? And Objective-C was a big, it was a very challenging program to learn, or programming language to learn. Even for a person who's very versed in, in C language and object-oriented programming, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. And we're going to still be using pieces of Objective-C because not every, not every piece has been changed, right? Some pieces are still... Uh, using Objective-C as opposed to Swift. So again, um, I think in order for you to be successful in this course, we got to focus back on that object-oriented programming stuff. If you're not good with that, you need to brush up on it. Because we're going to talk about it over and over again. What is object-oriented programming? Um, different concepts. I think one thing I missed by saying here, which I already said already, which is MVC, MVC, MVC. It's big on this one, yeah. MVC within Inside Xcode? Inside Xcode. Yeah, so it's it's part of the whole um, you know kind of uh, a workflow when it comes to developing iOS apps for uh, iPhone and iPad. It's all MVC, model view and controller, and sometimes it's a view controller and the model. That's what you're going to see more than anything else. Um, again, understanding uh, Objective C would help. Um, I think we all know we should all know in this class anyway. At this point, Java, a good foundation of Java and C plus plus. Sorry, C Sharp, C++, probably none of you understand yet. Uh, although, if you're taking the game programming course, you're going to learn it, right? Um, and I think it's key. If, if you're going to make do game programming, C++ is the way to go. But if you know C Sharp and Java and other object-oriented languages, um, it's not going to be undoable. But I guarantee you, this is definitely an advanced course. It's not something that's going to be easy. Okay, so for you guys who are thinking that it's going to be a breeze to pick up uh, you know, uh, iOS development, Android is easy. Okay, and Android uses anonymous inner, uh, inner classes, <laughs> all right? This is not easy. This is stuff that you, wrapping your brains around why these things work the way they do and why the designs, design decisions were made from Apple, uh, it's going to take some doing. So be patient. We're going to do a lot of work on understanding why things work the way they work, and we're going to work from one day to the other. If I have to extend a chapter, even though I'm saying I'm going to go chapter to chapter, if we have a lot of questions on a chapter, I'll slow it down. I don't care. It doesn't, we don't have to rush through it in order for us to finish the book. Okay? We can also skip chapters. If, we, if I look at a chapter and look at it and say, meh, it's kind of similar to what we did over here, and we'll move forward with that. Um, even if we, have, we have to, if we have to dwell on a particular chapter, I'd rather do that than uh, not get those skills. Let's talk about some sales, Deja, why it's really good to do iPhone. I like this idea, and I think this comes right from the book. It's crazy the millions of iPhones and millions of uh, from everything from the first generation iPhone, uh, which sold out really, really quickly, to the latest one, this iPhone 6, that sold out in a day and sold 10 million units in the first uh, weekend. It's crazy how many people own iPhones. We did this thing last time. I don't know if you remember. Um, for those of you who took my uh, advanced web programming class, uh, and by the way, nowadays it's a pure game programming class. There is no more. Uh, PHP. I've removed it because PHP is kind of an adonjumeau, right? It's not really that cool anymore, right? And it's more Node.js and stuff like that, right? So um, that's something that I like to focus on there. But remember what we what we did with this uh, gs.statcounter.com in terms of I'm going to go back to this in terms of total usage, right? From a worldwide perspective. So if I hit mobile browser as well in there, and I take out console just for a second. And 
um, let's take a look at uh, browser version. So I think I want to specify that. And we'll look at uh, over the last year period. So we'll go from um, January of 2014, let's say, to the present, January of 2015. And then we'll update the graph. And we'll also specify, instead of worldwide, we'll stick to North America, which is more relevant to us. Let's take a look. Because sometimes when we, what I want to look at is uh, it gives us an idea of how many browsers are hitting the web. Right, because let's let's you know we have to face that the fact that the killer app right now uh, is browser access, right? More than email access out there. We actually hit the browser more on our on our uh, devices than anything else. Sure, we check emails. We do a lot of texting. That's another big one, um, especially for women for for whatever reason they text more than men do. I'm not saying anything, Natasha. Just because you know, don't kill me. Don't kill me. Yet. <laughs> I know she's the only girl again, but it's okay, right? Uh, but if you look at the stats, iPhone, it says iPhone 0, but the iPhone browser, if you will, 10% of market share on its own, IE 11, I don't know why, but anyways, IE 11, Safari iPad, right, so Safari, Chrome for Android, which is up there, that's good, um, IE 8, God, dads, right, that's like uh, not compatible with Canvas, all kinds of other problems, uh, it's still 5% of market share out there, um, Android, is, is, is out there as well, IE10, IE9, and a bunch of Chrome, right? So that's kind of cool. It's interesting to understand that, that pattern, but you see iPhone still 10%, the top number one single usage device, right? Now there's others that combine to be 37% of the market, uh, but not a single device. If I look at operating system now, instead of browser, so an operating system that's accessing the, uh, the web and everything else, uh, Win 7 is pretty much up there, but number 2 is iOS, right? Which kind of, tell, kind of tells you, like, and it has 18% market share. So you're, you're, you know, someone who's a business person. Can you really afford, like I said to you before, we talked about this before in, in, uh, in uh, Comp 2068 when we did advanced uh, web programming. Can you really afford to do, to not look at an iOS device or an Android device that combined do 29% uh, market share? Right? I don't think so anymore. I don't think it's really viable for you to, not to think about uh, mobile devices. So why iOS? Because, and this is just the stats, it's the number one mobile operating system that's out there right now. Right? That's why. And it's, and it's probably a more of a money maker in terms of apps and everything else on Android for now. They've sold billions and billions of apps. Yeah. So, uh, uh, when you buy a new Mac, I got $100 credit. There you go. So that's 100 bucks that I could pay for it, like that I have. And we all get that, especially if you have an educational plan with Mac, right? which we should all have by now, right? If you're going to buy a Mac, um, I know some people are hardcore Linux people, right? They're like, bah, Mac OS and uh, Windows. My name is Steven and I like Linux, right? <laughs> I'm just saying, it doesn't matter. Both of you probably like it. <laughs> How's that? You got a Mac finally? No. Oh, good, good for you. <laughs> This is my backup computer. It's a backup machine. It's not even his first machine, right? And some of you may be like, well, I'm never going to change my PC because it's crazy expensive to go with Mac. I, I have the same, uh, it's the John, the John Luke's of the world. I'm going to, I'm going to virtualize, right? I'm going to, you know, I'm going to create a virtual machine. And yes, officially you can't have a virtual machine that runs uh, Yosemite, but unofficially they're available, right? So can you do it? Yes. Um, I will give you the ability to do whatever you want, like as normal. I'm not going to tell you you have to use the machine in front of you and all the restrictions that you have here. If you want to use your own device and you want to load up uh, a version of uh, virtualized Yosemite, as long as it gives you the uh, playground that we need and Xcode 6, I'm good to go. Okay, so I'm not going to force you to do anything like, like before. It just doesn't make any sense. So, <clears throat> so again, lots of reasons why um, I'd want to invest time in learning iOS development. All right, and definitely 18% market share is a good enough reason for anybody to do that, especially if you're a developer um, in any way. So that's one thing. Um, same thing with iPad. iPad, I think, you know, we talked about, let's go back, I don't know how that flashed there. Um, iPad data was right behind there. I think the problem with iPad, and this is funny to say, once you get an iPhone, right, especially the iPhone 6, I found that I'm using my iPad less. I don't know if you guys noticed that. The bigger the, 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 the viewport size, or the, the screen, the, the size factor, if you will, the, the uh, uh, I find that I use my tablets less, right? 
than, than before. So I have my iPhone 6. Before it was so small that reading a book on my iPhone was hard, right? Now I can, I can do it, and it's, it's, not, it's not uncomfortable, right? And it has enough memory and speed that I can do other things too, like play uh, some decent games and everything else if I'm waiting somewhere, um, listen to music uninterrupted, and do a bunch of stuff, you know, by moving from one app to the other fairly quickly. So I know the iPad, the iPad minis, the reason why they're so um, successful is you can slip them into a little case. And they're not that big and obtrusive like the 10-inch iPads, the original ones that they came out with. But I'll tell you that um, a lot of kids, once they get their cell phones, this is statistics here, right? They ditch their iPads. I don't know why that is. They don't use them as much. They just go by the wayside. And a lot of them still prefer, if I'm going to use an iPad, or let's say, for example, a Surface. Like, we, we still have a person on the left Surface. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to look at you. Uh, but I know that, you know, some people still like the Surface, as an example, because it's a small, compact device that they can use and they can carry around. Right, um, but still, I, I think a lot of people prefer the desktop. If I was going to choose between tablet, desktop, and I was playing a game, I still think desktop for me. I don't know about you guys, right? And um, when if I'm going to go between my phone and my desktop and tablet, so I have all three, right? I go right from here to there. I don't even look at the tablet anymore, right? The only time I look at the tablet is when I can't take this with me, plane. I'm on a plane and I can't carry my my uh, uh, my desktop with me. If I'm away on vacation, and I don't feel like risking my desktop to bring it with me. It's okay. If I bring my iPad and it gets lost, eh, you know what? It's not that expensive anymore, right? I bring my, my, my Mac, it's $3,000, right? <laughs> I don't want to do that. I don't want to have that problem with my Mac, right? So, so these are the things that you know, we, we, make, we make choices in it. We see is as the, the form factor gets bigger on the iPhones, we tend to use our tablets less. And I think there's gonna, we're going to come to a point where we're going to have one device again. We're going to have one device that does it all, like you know, one ring to rule them all, right? It's coming. it's coming, for sure. I know, I know, I have to say it, right? Especially with the combination of, of, of Apple Watch. How is that going to play into it? So I have my, my Apple Watch, which I get my notifications on, right, maybe. It has a taptic sensor and it has everything else. It tells me my heart rate and everything else so I can be a superstar. I can be a superhero, right? right? Because of my, of my iPhone. I, I can't be a superhero without my watch. Once I get my watch, I'm a superhero now, right? And then uh, my iPhone, and somehow, if it rings here, well, God forbid, it'll ring everywhere now. It'll ring here, it'll ring on the phone, on my, on my, uh, my I don't know, uh, Stephen's shaking his head. He said he doesn't like it, right? But uh, I'm so telling you, that. huh? Um, I get calendar updates from six different devices. So. Yeah, that's a problem, right? So these are the things that, unified messaging is definitely an issue for us. I don't know if it, if it, if it bothers you, but it bothers the crap out of me, right? So there's some real good app opportunities out there for uh, some smart developers. How do I bring these communications together? What do I do? I know that these things are coming. How can I design an, an interface or an app for my phone or my watch? Right. So lots of sales. Um, they added a bunch of gestures um, uh, lately. I'm not going to go over them. I think most of you know them. These sensors are neat. Sensors are neat. We have the accelerometer that's been there for a long time. Uh, the 3-axis gyro uh, that's been there since iPhone 4. Um, again, uh, more sensitive to motion um, by uh, figuring out where the what the rotation is. There's the compass that came in from iPhone 3, right? So it has a built-in compass. Again, for Android users, you're like, yeah, whatever. It's an, that's old hat. Right? I've had these sensors for a long time. And I think one thing that Android has, some of them have uh, temperature uh, uh, settings as well, some, some devices. And all that stuff, which iPhones don't have, right? Um, an ambient light sensor so it can change the, uh, the brightness of the screen. Uh, proximity sensors so when you put it next to your ear, um, then it reacts. Um, a magnetic sensor so when you close the iPad cover, it doesn't work on the iPhone, but for the iPad it does have that. GPS, of course. Uh, Touch ID, which is becoming, I think that's one of my, that's like the number one thing I use all the time. I don't ever swipe and put my code anymore. I just use my, my, my fingerprint. I don't know if you guys do that. But as soon as I had it available, I didn't think I would ever use it. I was like, iPhone 5 users, you're crazy. Why would you put your fingerprint on there? And now I'm like, I don't want to type my code anymore. Right? I just want to do this. Right? Press the button. Um, an NFC sensor, which has been around for Android for a long, long time. Right? They've had NFC and the ability to do Apple Pay kind of stuff for a long time. They just never did it. Right? Um, finally, Apple came out, and now everyone's on it. Right? Like before. They already dropped them. What's that? Walmart's already dropped them. They dropped it, but it's going to come back. I oh, it so. is. I really hope so because I want them to find supported. Actually, there's going to be issues in Canada though. 
They've already done it. I've already had it. I was at, uh, I told you I work with the LCBO on different projects. And one of the things they had was uh, we had a user that came up from, um, he came up from uh, uh, the States and he had an Apple Pay enabled phone, an iPhone 6. And he was like, okay, can I, can I pay? And I go, sure. He takes his phone, boop. And I was like, you got a credit card in there? He goes, no, no, I got Apple Pay. And I go, how does it work up here? It's not enabled up here, but it is. Right. You can hack it to work up there. If you, well, you could, but you well, know. For Android, sorry. But for Apple Pay, uh, it's only available down there. So if you have an That's Apple, good. if you have a U.S. credit card, um, you're good to go. Or U.S. debit. They don't use debit as much down there, by the way, as we do. We use more debit up here uh, than many places in the States. Yeah. Yeah, I went down to the States. You have to swipe to get it. Yeah, which is really weird. They don't have tap. Um, and they don't have chip a lot as, as much uh, in the States, which you, you would think, you know, if you think of your head, you're saying, you're saying to yourself, States, you know, they're at least 10 times bigger than us, right? At least, right? Maybe more. Uh, and many things, they, they, what they do, they are, they are big. They're 450 million people, right? And yet, they don't have security down. Or they don't have these... It's actually what caused the issue with Android. The um, banks up here, the, the NFC, the, all that swipe technology, yeah. they put their own security guidelines for it yeah. before it came up with, with Android. So now with Google Pay, it can't be up here because it doesn't conform to the Canadian Not security... Yet. Stuff. So yep. I'm hoping now that Apple's in that camp. They're going to do it. They're going to do it. What, were, what was your point? I was going to say, I heard uh, one of the main reasons is they don't want to slow down people's paying for stuff. People so swipe it and sign and instead of putting their hands in the station. Like, okay, I like the tap, man. Dude. Uh, it's way faster. Than tap. Than you just go through, you're like, yeah, yeah whatever, it's under 100 bucks. Beep. Yeah. Okay, good, thanks. Give me my thing off. Right? I don't have to talk to anybody. I don't have to listen to anybody. <laughs> in and out. There's a problem with that, right? If you lose your credit card, you're in trouble, right? Uh, they can tap, yeah. But it's only 100 bucks at a time, at least. Not, and if you lose it, you can, if hopefully you report it fast enough. But, um, but I think that, you know, you can't do anything with 50 bucks. It used to be $50, and $50 didn't do anything. So from an NFC perspective, I think it, we're going in the right direction. I'm not sure that, um, you know, we're going to have uh, traction on that this year in 2015. I think if I was to make a prediction, I think it would be probably by the end of 2015, well, where they're actually going to start using it more often. Although when it does come out, I'm going to sign up. <laughs> Which is really weird, right? Uh, uh, some really cool accessibility features. I know there's been people, I've seen people here uh, at the college that have used uh, accessibility features that are available to iPhone. And they say, the only reason why I use an iPhone is because of the accessibility. They don't like the iPhone. They would want to get an Android, but they find the accessibility features um, are better for some reason or another on the iPhone, right? And I'm thinking about um, uh, different people that I've seen here. Right. So I don't know if you guys have the same experience, but from an accessibility perspective, um, they've really gone a long way. I'm not going to go over iPhone 6 and 6 Plus features. Um, again, Apple Pay being the one we just talked about. Um, iOS, when it first came out in, in, in 2007, um, they had it on the iPod. I remember that. And uh, I thought the iPod was like a really expensive, like, media player. I was like, who the hell would get an iPod? That's crazy, right? It was crazy expensive. Um, but as they brought out the new, the, the iPhone, when they came out with the iPhone, uh, and it was, it was the same operating system they had on the iPad, on the iPod. So now I'm thinking, because I had Apple, I had Windows phones back then. Right? I remember I had Blackberries. I was working for Bell. And I was always like, man, I wish I could play music on my phone. Right? I really wanted it. And then I saw that there's like a phone, this iPhone 3G, um, that they had, that you can play music and everything else. And back then, Motorola didn't quite get it right, and they still don't have it right with uh, uh, with their phones. And that's why uh, they, you know, now that they've been bought up by Google and everything else, I still think they're not quite right. Those phones, they're not in terms, especially in terms of uh, uh, MP3 uh, capabilities and all that kind of stuff. And and by the way, whoever says MP3 anymore, anyway, I used to say an MP3 player, right? That was the big talk. Do you have an MP3 player? I got an MP3 player. It's on my phone, right? We don't say that anymore. Now I say I got a media player. I can play movies, right? I can I can look at uh, Netflix, right? And when I'm bored, right, I can play games. So these are good things, and it all started from things like um, these uh, technologies that we built upon. And, I, and just as an aside, I'll, I'll I'll digress a little bit. If we ever build a transport, right? <laughs> no, I'm serious. If I ever build, if I ever build a teleporter. Right? If you think about it, it's the same kind of thing. I know, uh, you know, Kevin's laughing at me, right? But I'm telling you like this. The reason why I say it like this. Because uh, Jean-Luc and I had debates over this. You had the debates, right? But I've, I, I mean, we had debates with my friends too. But the thing is, when you look at the iPhone and all that kind of stuff, it's like you're building a teleporter, right? But really slowly, 
right? And the first thing you need if you're going to be a good, have a good teleporter is the ability for us to scan at the quark level, right? If you can't scan at the quark level, you're going to die, right? Something bad is going to happen to you. I'm just saying, right? So, um, so in order for us to build to that, to be able to scan at the quark level, there's a lot of little ancillary technologies that got to take place. And this is what's happening with the iPhone. If you think about it, not just because we're going to teleport with the iPhone one day, but because, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, but because we need these ancillary technologies to build up to something that's a cool device that we're going to carry with us. Ten years ago, this device would be unbelievable and impossible. You couldn't even think about it in your, in your pocket. 128 gig hard drive, right, in your pocket um, with a chip that's faster than any computer that existed back then, right? That's crazy in your pocket. Right, a, f a, a camera. By the way, it's wiped out all my camera. I don't need a camera anymore. I have this. Pretty soon it'll be like my binocular too. Right? It'll be something weird. Right? It'll it'll replace different things. And we say, oh, I would never use that. But we always say that oh, I'm never going to use that. But as soon as it becomes available, all of a sudden we're using it because it's available to us to use. So iOS, the the history of iOS. When we go through it, every every piece of iOS adds additional functionality that we always think, wow, that's neat. But I don't think I'll ever use that. Like Siri. I never thought I was going to use that. I use it all the time, right? Especially when I'm driving. I think that's where I use Siri the most. I want Siri to read me my text messages because I don't want to be stopped by the cops, right? I want Siri to send a text message even if it sends it badly, right? I still want that to happen. And I want Siri to find the closest Starbucks because, you know what, I don't want to go to Timmy's. I'm just saying, right? So that's what I, I get it to do a lot. Um, there's some stuff we're going to tap into, like Grand Central Dispatch is something that was introduced in iOS 4, um, which I know a lot of programmers like because it, it kind of, you know, I, I heard about it way back. I didn't quite understand it because I was like, what does that mean at Grand Central Dispatch? Well, whole asynchronous programming model uh, stuff, if you can do that with your iPhone, that's really cool. So that goes outside of the whole thread capability uh, where you can manage multiple threads and true multitasking with your phone. Uh, we'll probably touch upon it, scratch the surface of it here, because really, if you think about it, if we were going to look at this as, a, as an iOS course, this would be like, can we scratch the surface iOS course? That's what this course is going to be, because we're going to touch a little bit of Swift. Yeah. Is yeah. it basically an asynchronous handler? So it, it assigns for you the, the threads you need? Yes. Right <laughs> yes. Right? That's what it's like. It, it is that. And that's the Grand Central Station. It is like Grand Central Station. Grand Central Dispatch. Right? There we go. Um, I'm just trying to, uh, trying to think about, how about... Uh, AirPlay, that was crazy. As soon as AirPlay came out, who has uh, Apple TV at home, right? I know I have three. <laughs> I didn't believe in that beginning. I was like, Apple TV, who the hell wants that, right? Um, but I found that uh, when you combine Apple TV with your Mac or your iOS devices and with AirPlay, you know all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Like, for example, I think my son, who's like two, uses my Apple TV more than anybody, right? Because why? He surfs on Netflix. I want to see Umizumi, right? That's what he does. And he just presses the button. He knows how to press the arrow and press down to make it go. And he'll just do that. Sometimes he'll just keep pressing it and it'll start and stop just because he wants to see the, the image start and stop all the time, right? But the point is that that's what he does. I have a, an Apple TV in my car, right? Because inside my, uh, my pilot, I have a screen, right? And I'm thinking for long trips, my wife, of course, I had to prove it through her. I was like, wife, look, I need to get this, uh, <laughs> this Apple TV, right? I, I found my car, right? And she goes, is this because you're, you're a computer programming teacher? I'm saying, yes, yes, it's because that, right? I wanna, uh, so I have my Apple TV in my car. And um, I have it in there because um, I find that um, when my, my son and my daughter get really bored, right? Uh, if only I could have two screens that did two different things, that'd be great. Because, you know, my son wants to watch, uh, you know, Pokemo, right? And my daughter wants to watch, like, you know, some kind of high school kid movie or whatever. Um, and it's hard for them to do both. So that's where she brings her iPad. That's the only reason why she has an iPad, so she can carry it around in the car with her, right? But the reason why I'm talking about this stuff is once we get these new technologies, we start to use them. And now we – because in this course, we'll have access to the um, – uh, to the SDK that allows us to tap into them, right? Um, I still don't quite use Passbook. I'm not sure if you guys have ever uh, done that too much. I use it a little bit only for my Starbucks. I don't know if you noticed that. And there's a couple of other cards like uh, Air Miles. I put my Passbook, uh, Air Miles in my Passbook as well. And all it does is keep track of things to scan. So if I have things to scan, like my uh, Cineplex card would be in my pack Passbook. So there's a few uh, things I have in Passbook. So I'm not sure if it's that successful. 
Maps is okay. It's, it's come a long way. Uh, I think still Google Maps is better, right? If I was going to compare it to, uh, to Google Maps. So the Google Maps, especially that's on the Android, is even better, right, than, than it is on uh, Apple devices. But it's come a long way. The original Maps that came out uh, back when Maps came out in I uh, uh, iOS 7 or iOS 6 were bad. Like you got lost with those maps, right? You make you put those maps on, you're like, wait a minute, it doesn't show my house. The icon was even the navigational error. Yeah, it was kind of weird, right? It's, no, it was serious, it was weird, right? And now they've improved it to the point where they have a really good talk. Uh, it, it's uh, incorporated with with uh, with Siri, so it talks to you and it does 3D just like Google Maps. Um, and they, I think, one of the re the the design decisions they made was because they wanted to cut Google out. They didn't want to give Google money every single time, right? And I think that was one of the decisions they made. It was a money thing. Follow the money. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this. I think last, uh, in, in uh, the WD, uh, WWDC in June of 2014, probably was the most exciting one for me. As soon as I saw the Swift programming language, I was like, what? They're inventing a new language now? Only Apple could do that, right? <laughs> No, seriously, right? The last that, who, when's the last time we invented a new language, right? Facebook. It's been a long time. I mean, how long has, has how long has it been? A year. But who uses it? Not very right. <laughs> <laughs> but how long has it been since we've had a real, true uh, object-oriented language that's come out? It's been a while. It's been a long time, right? So, uh, has it been needed? Like, why didn't? Here's the question that I always have: Why do they just use something like I hate to say this, JavaScript? or action script, something that was already out there. I know people are whining, but uh, it's out there, right? ECMAScript 6 is around the corner. It's supposed to come out this year, which is almost what Swift is doing. So why didn't they do that? Because it didn't pre really quite comply with everything they wanted. It didn't do everything they wanted to do, so that's why they created Swift, right? Um, and why did they move away from Objective-C? If Objective-C was such a good language for so many years, how come they moved away from it? Because it was a barrier to create iOS apps. That's why. People didn't get into iOS development because of uh, Objective C. That was a really big reason. And there's a bunch of like these sites that'll convert stuff. Like you'll take your JavaScript and convert it to iOS. It'll take your C sharp and convert it to iOS, but not iOS native. And you know what happens? You get apps that are super slow with that kind of thing. Like PhoneGap is cool, but slow, right? So they said, wait, we don't need PhoneGap. Let's take these middlemen out of the equation. They're making all this money to develop apps on our iPhone, right? Let's just build a language that people can learn. Yeah? Would you say people wouldn't develop for iOS if it wasn't so popular because of Objective-C? It wasn't popular because of Objective-C. Objective-C actually put a barrier. I really do think so. Like, it wasn't, a, it wasn't the same thing. If, if there was an Objective-C, if it was Java, just like Android, a lot more apps would have been developed for, uh, for iOS, right? And Java is not, the Java that Android uses is not easy Java. Right? Like I said, it's a bastardized version of it. Swift is no bastardized version. It's its own language, and it's kind of cool, when you, as you'll see. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to flip through. Apple Watch, I talked about that a little bit. I'm not going to go too much into that. We don't have it. And Objective-C, we still need to use Objective-C. I think that's the key. And if you notice, this, this goes back to the 1970s with C, the original C language uh, that was de uh, developed by uh, Dennis Ritchie and Bell. Right? I think that... Uh, you know, yeah, it was cool that they made Objective-C because they wanted to add uh, object-oriented language to the original C language. But I think somewhere along the line, it was like, it's almost like a language that got bastardized and more bastardized and more bastardized as it went. Seriously. Like they took it, they changed it like English. They changed it, they, me they, they messed it around, and they made it work for their, for their devices for a very long time. And they realized finally that they had to move into the future. And they had to abandon the, the, the past and move forward. And that's why they did that with Objective-C. Now, there's so much written with Objective-C right now that they can't fully uh, let it go. There's a lot of uh, systems and um, libraries that we're still going to have to tap into that, were, that are made in Objective-C. But again, over the next several years, they're going to get rid of them. And I think I'm going to stop there for now. So I, think there's, I'm gonna, I don't want to bore the crap out of you with my lecture. Um, and maybe we'll, when we come back, I'll take a, a brief break and we'll come back and we'll talk about Xcode 6 and I'll show you a little bit about that.